One thing I still need is a sexy title for my book. My current working title is Reconceptualizing the Multifarious Notions of Work and Leisure in the Age of Digitalized Automation. <laughs> to my ear, that sounds pretty sexy, but I can't help thinking that a punchier title might be possible. So if you can think of anything, I'm open to suggestions. The basic premise of the book is this. The computer revolution has expanded the possibilities of replacing human labor with machines, the process we call automation. This is likely to have, in fact, is already having massive consequences for the nature of uh, work, the role that work plays in people's lives, and the well-being of whole communities that have traditionally been held together by particular industries or local employment opportunities. It's therefore really important that we reflect deeply and critically on both work and leisure, on how we conceive of them, on what's influenced our thinking, on what our attitudes to work and leisure are, on how these might usefully be revised, and on what policies might help us best cope with the automation revolution. My view is that we should enthusiastically embrace the prospect of increased leisure that automation makes possible. But we can't rely on market forces operating freely to bring this about in a way that improves people's lives. Right now, many people have less work than they need, and many people have to work harder than they want to. What's needed is a redistribution of work, this can be encouraged by government policies that make it easier for people to live comfortably and without anxieties on modest incomes and therefore enable us to re reap the most important potential benefits of automation, namely increased leisure. And given the prospect of more leisure in the future, our education system, which has been increasingly focused on training people for the workforce, should devote more time and resources preparing people to get the most out of their leisure time. There's plenty of seats at the front for people who don't want to stand for the next half hour. So let's think about work. This is the Big Rock Candy Mountain. It's a famous folk song that paints a humorous portrait of a certain kind of utopia. Here's one verse. The defining feature of the Big Rock Candy Mountain is that life is wonderfully easy. You don't have to earn money because the handouts grow on bushes. Um, you don't have to, um, uh, there are no tools, there are like axes, saws or picks, so you don't have to do any manual work. You don't have to cook your eggs because the hens lay them soft boiled. You never even need to change your socks. In fact, work of any kind is viewed very critically. In the Big Rock Candy Mountain, they hung the jerk that invented work. The song belongs to a literary and philosophical tradition that's very rich and that takes a negative view of work and celebrates leisure. The tradition goes back thousands of years. Adam and Eve in paradise, according to all the evidence, just lounged around, they ate low-hanging fruit and went skinny dipping. Since they didn't wear clothes, they never had to change their socks or even their fig leaves. But after they got busted for eating forbidden fruit, they were condemned to labor. Eve to the labor of childbirth, Adam to laboring among thorns and thistles, so that he had to eat his bread in the sweat of his brow. From the beginning then, work was understood to be a curse. Nostalgia for a golden age didn't need to work uh, um, when people didn't need to work because nature provided everything spontaneously is actually common in, in many mythologies. And 3,000 years later, the tradition is alive and well and finds expression in numerous songs and stories. Oscar Wilde famously turned a Puritan maxim on its head with the witty observation that work is the curse of the drinking classes. But you don't have to drink to take a dim view of work. So why have many people for so long considered work a curse, disliked by those who do it and looked down on by those who don't? Well, here are a few of the reasons. And one can talk at length about each of these. Here I'll just make a few observations. Until recent times, most work was manual work. And so when intellectuals like Aristotle in ancient Greece or Adam Smith in the 18th century, when they discuss work, this is primarily what they have in mind. For Aristotle, work means the sort of activity a person is forced to do as a means to an end. It's what a slave does, or what a lower class person does, to make the money they need in order to live. Most work back then, and until really, and really until quite recently, was hard manual labor. Digging, plowing, planting, harvesting, chopping, building, hauling, fetching, carrying. It was filthy, exhausting, boring, and uncomfortable. No one in the right mind would freely choose to do it. Having to spend one's life in this way was self-evidently self -evidently a misfortune. 
It's degrading, since you're little better than a beast of burden, ordered around by your superiors, and it leads to moral and spiritual impoverishment. Leisure, by contrast, means freedom from work and freedom from other people telling you what to do. For Aristotle, leisure is the precondition for living a fully human life, which is a life in which you develop to the full your human faculties, studying nature, appreciating art, cultivating friendships, and being politically engaged with one's community. From the perspective of the leisured classes, then, work was degrading in two ways. First of all, it was manual, which means it's kind of sordid. And this attitude to manual work was not confined to ancient Greece. In a famous book called The Theory of the Leisure Class, Thorstein Veblen writes about Polynesian chiefs who supposedly starved to death rather than feed themselves with their own hands. And this attitude to manual work had a long life. In 14th century Italy, um, professors of medicine would lecture from the podium, but they would never themselves perform um, dissections. They would read out the lectures while a barber or a butcher did the nasty work of dissecting animals to illustrate um, anatomy. And this upper-class prejudice against manual work is less pronounced today, but it hasn't um, entirely disappeared. Um, in an earlier draft of this work, <laughs> this piece, I thought of, of uh, saying, well, who wouldn't prefer their son or daughter to marry a philosophy professor rather than a plumber. <laughs> and then I thought, well, actually, I wouldn't. One philosopher is enough in a family, and we could really use a plumber. <laughs> a second reason why work was disparaged um, and seen as degrading was because it was done for money. And doing something for money in itself, from the point of view of Aristotle, um, sullies the soul. Today, rather obviously, we don't think that way. Fat cat CEOs and others who clearly don't need to work pay themselves millions, and they don't seem to feel much shame. But back in the day, working for pay was suspect. One thing that Plato held against the sophists, the teachers of rhetoric, who posed as philosophers of a sort, was that they charged a fee. They charged their students fees, whereas true philosophers like Socrates never charged a fee. A Roman lawyer in the second century argued that what a lawyer does is so valuable that it, quote, should not be dishonored by a fee. Obviously, times have changed, as anyone who's ever hired a lawyer can attest. But I do want to point out that in all the years it's been going, the Burger and Forum has never dishonoured its presenters by offering them a fee. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the objection to work that it's alienating and um, exploitative is central to Karl Marx's critique of capitalism, of course, in, in the mid-19th century. Marx is not actually opposed to work itself, just to the misery that it had come to be for the working class following the Industrial Revolution. Pointless work is a relatively new phenomenon, quite modern. The technical term preferred by social scientists for this is bullshit jobs, which is the title of a recent book published last year by the anthropologist David Graeber. Incidentally, that's the kind of title I'm looking for for my book. Right. <laughs> uh, one with punch. Graeber distinguishes between shit jobs, which are just nasty, unpleasant, and low-paying, and bullshit jobs, which are comfortable enough, perhaps, even well-paying, but which those doing them realize serve no valuable purpose. According to a recent poll, 37% of employees in the UK thought that their work made no meaningful contribution to the world. Anyone who's worked inside a large bureaucracy will have found themselves attending meetings that are entirely unproductive, <coughs> compiling data that no one cares about, writing reports that no one reads, etc. Happily, most people here work in academia where this sort of thing is pretty much unknown. As I said, Greek and Roman intellectuals tended to view most manual and mercenary labor as somewhat shameful. Jews, Christians, and Muslims had more respect for it, especially the skilled professions. Even so, shame has always attached to some kinds of work. The public executioner, for instance, always had to wear a mask. How do you know if a certain kind of work is shameful? Here's a test. Would a kid be embarrassed to say what it is that their mother or father did for a living? I just want to pause there and stop. Can anyone think of a kind of work today that is considered shameful? Sex work. Yes, exactly. Stripping, um, prostitution right, would be um, one kind of work. And it's interesting, I always think, to reflect on the difference between, say, prostitutes and surgeons. The prostitute says, no pay, no pleasure, and is despised. The surgeon says, no pay, and you can continue in pain, and is respected. My kids are fairly broad-minded, 
But I think they'd probably want to keep it a secret if any family member worked for the Trump administration. Aversion to work has often been assumed to be ingrained in human nature. European coloni colonialists were forever complaining about the inherent laziness of the indigenous or enslaved peoples that they wished to exploit. And Samuel Johnson, the compiler of the first great English dictionary, observed that, quote, every man is or hopes to be an idler. But over time, especially in the last century or two, both our conception of work and our attitude towards work has become broader and more complex. Um, in the Middle Ages, society was said to be roughly divided into the three classes from uh, right to left there. Uh, those who work, the labourers, those who fight, the knights and nobles, vassals and lords, and those who pray, the monks, the nuns and the clergy. Gradually in the modern era, the latter two categories shrank in importance, while the class of those who work grew to include increasing numbers of non-agricultural workers um, and non-manual workers, teachers, lawyers, doctors, academics, technicians, engineers, journalists, publishers, accountants, bookkeepers, managers, administrators, and so on. So the concept of work broadened, and this change was accompanied by a more positive view of work, at least among those not mired in the miseries of slavery or early industrialization. Instead of being seen as a curse, work was increasingly touted as a blessing, so let's consider some of the reasons why. The Protestant Reformation, which began in the early 1500s, obviously exercised an important influence here. Work came to be seen as a religious obligation. Children are taught that the, the idle hands are the devil's tools. And the notion that each of us has a calling arose. Originally, the concept of a calling was a purely religious notion. One was called to do God's work, the way John the Baptist or Paul the Apostle were called. Eventually, though, it was given a broader interpretation. Your calling is your true vocation in life, the kind of work you're best at and that will bring you the greatest satisfaction. There's a direct route between the Calvinist notion of a calling and the advice given by every graduation speaker to discover your passion. You especially see these changing ideas and attitudes regarding work in the, 19th and, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Philosophers like John Locke and Adam Smith argue that labor is the ultimate source of a, child, of a society's wealth. Moralists like Ben Franklin extol the virtue of industriousness. Trade unionists and socialists start talking about the dignity of labor. Radicals in the 19th century opposed overwork, they opposed low pay, child labor in unsafe conditions, and so forth. But their dream was not of the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Their dream was of a society where, in which, to quote a Chartist pamphlet, every man has an opportunity of getting his living by the sweat of his brow. A great deal of 19th and early 20th century literature reflects this shift in attitude towards work. In Jane Austen's novels, for instance, the main characters with whom the reader identifies typically belong to the leisured gentry. They might find themselves hard up a little bit at, at times, but hard up for them means giving, moving to a smaller house and making do with just one or two servants. Some of the men folk get cushy jobs with the Church of England, but otherwise the thought of working for money is not to be considered. The only work they do is really for charity. Later on, half a century later, in George Eliot's novels, though, characters who do skilled work, like Adam Bede, the carpenter, or Caleb Garth, the estate manager in Middlemarch, are shown a great deal of respect. And the exclusion of women from the professions comes to be seen as a serious problem. I want to read a short passage from Charlotte Bronte's novel, Shirley, um, which makes this explicit. Caroline demanded Miss Kildar abruptly, don't you wish you had a profession or a trade? I wish it 50 times a day. As it is, I often wonder what I came into the world for. I long to have something absorbing and compulsory to fill my head and hands and to occupy my thoughts. Can labor alone make a human being happy? No, but it can give varieties of pain and prevent us from breaking our hearts with a single tyrant master torture, by which she means love. Besides, she says, successful labor has its recompense. A vacant, weary, lonely, hopeless life has none. And that's how this leisured woman in the novel thinks of her own life as vacant, weary, lonely, and hopeless because she has no trade or profession. So is work a curse or a blessing? Needless to say, there's no single answer and there's no simple answer to that. All these views of and about work are like streams flowing into our current thinking, which is inevitably therefore somewhat inconsistent and confused. And a similar point, by the way, could be made about our concept of leisure which is associated with freedom and self-realization, and with play and recreation, but also with idleness and laziness. 
Today, we continually and confusingly receive two messages. On the one hand, hard work is touted in every school as the key to success. Supermarkets hail the employee of the week. And among working people at every social and professional level, it's far more common to hear people boasting about how busy they are and how hard they work than how much free time they enjoy. Yet out of the other side of its mouth, our society still holds before us as the ultimate prize, the dream of becoming one of the fortunate few who, as a result of luck, daring, intelligence or toil, no longer needs to work but can kick back and recreate. Think Margaritaville. That, after all, is presumably one of the main reasons why Americans spend over $60 billion a year on lottery tickets. This confusion isn't entirely recent. In Dickens' David Copperfield, Uriah Heep observes, I quote, they used to teach us at school from 9 o'clock to 11 that labor was a curse, and from 11 o'clock to 1 that it was a blessing and a cheerfulness and a dignity, and I don't know what all. Moralists like John Calvin, Ben Franklin, Thomas Carlyle preached a gospel of work, and that became very influential in the Victorian period, and it's remained a mainstream ideology ever since. And yet the work ethic has always had its critics. In the 19th century, John Stuart Mill opposed Thomas Carlyle's gospel of work with a gospel of leisure, arguing plausibly enough that self-realization was incompatible with a life of exhausting, stiffening, stupefying toil. Karl Marx's son-in-law, Paul Lafargue, writing in the late 19th century, he criticized the way that well-intentioned labor movement slogans about the right to work and the dignity of labor were effectively preaching slogans, uh, preaching values that ultimately served the interests of the capitalists rather than the working class. Work, he says, in The Right to be Lazy, famous book that he wrote, should be nothing more than a mere condiment to the pleasures of idleness. A condiment is something like mustard or ketchup or gravy or salad dressing that you add to a food to make it more interesting and flavorful. And it's a nice conceit. Leisure should be the main dish, work a little something on the side. The famous uh, British philosopher of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell, echoes this sentiment, sentiment in his famous essay in Praise of Idleness. The morality of work, he, he writes, is the morality of slaves, and the modern world has no need of slavery. The work ethic, says Russell, is outmoded because labor-saving technology should enable us to satisfy all our needs while re greatly reducing the hours spent doing boring jobs. Hitherto, he says, we have, be we have continued to be as energetic as we were before there were machines. In this, we have been foolish, but there's no reason to go on being foolish forever. From now on, the road to happiness and prosperity lies in an organized diminution of work. In 1930, the well-known economist John Maynard Keynes published a short essay titled Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. In this essay, he predicted that increases in productivity due to technological progress would lead within a century to most people enjoying much more leisure. He believed that by 2030, the average working week would be around 15 hours. Well, 90 years later, it doesn't look like that prediction will come true. Most full-time workers work two, three, or four times that, and many part-time workers would work more hours if they could, could, since they need the money. Now, to be fair, Keynes wasn't utterly and totally wrong. Um, here's a graph of um, working hours over the, the last 100 years or so in Switzerland, Italy, Belgium, and France, and you can see there has been a steady decline. In, in the US, for what it's worth, in 1860, the average was 62 hours. In 1900, it was 53 hours. In 2017, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that the average American works 44 hours a week. A downward trend, but nothing like as fast as Russell and Keynes hoped for or predicted. Um, actually, actually, how many hours a, a, a year or a week people work is, is a pretty difficult calculation. There's a lot of kind of variables and complexities that are difficult to take into account. But one thing most researchers seem to agree upon is that there has been a shift in who works hardest. Um, Blue-collar workers used to work much longer hours than professionals. Today, many highly educated workers, like managers, doctors, lawyers, financiers and the like, put in many, many more hours than other people and work longer hours than they used to. It does seem true, incidentally, that Americans work m many more hours per year than people in most of the countries, certainly most of the developed countries. Partly because they get shorter holidays and less paid leave. Um, and certainly you can read countless articles reporting that people feel overworked and stressed out and that many of us are working more now than we used to 20 years ago. I think it's reasonable to say that for the majority of working people, things have got better over the last 100 years. Most of us work less and enjoy more leisure than our forebears. 
Yet I agree with Russell and Keynes. Things could be better and should be much better. Tens of millions of people work more than they want to, while tens of millions of people are unemployed or underemployed. So the question arises, why haven't we come closer to realising the expectations of Russell and Keynes and others? Why, given the progress of automation, the huge increases in productivity, aren't we living more leisured lives? There was a book published in 2012 by um, well-known economists, um, the Skidelskys, uh, father and son, and they offered an interesting answer. According to them, Keynes's mistake was his failure to realise that capitalism has unleashed forces that can't be brought under control. Specifically, he says, it's inflamed a natural desire for recognition and status. It's turned it into an insatiable desire for ever more wealth, because wealth is the thing more than anything else that in our society gives us status. If we could just settle for a modest level of comfort, we could work less, far less. But the yearning for more wealth and more stuff leads people now to spend far more time working than they need to. The same insatiability characterizes our society as a whole. Every politician and most economists take for granted that we should be striving to achieve economic growth without limit. The wisdom of this is rarely questioned. If, for instance, during the next set of presidential debates, you take a shot of whiskey every time one of the candidates questions the w wisdom of relentlessly pursuing unlimited economic growth, I predict you'll end the evening disappointingly sober. In my view, the Sigidelsky's explanation of why we still work much more than Keynes predicted isn't entirely wrong, but I don't think it's the whole story or even the main reason. It's no doubt true of some people they are driven to work more than they need to by insatiable greed. But I suspect that far more people work the hours they do because of circumstances beyond their control. Some of these are pretty obvious. For instance, some people work many hours because their hourly wage is low, so they work overtime or they perhaps take a second job just in order to have enough to live on. The situation of these people is memorably documented in Barbara Ehrenreich's book, in Nickel and Dimed, which I recommend heartily. Um, some people live in uh, expensive metropolitan areas like Boston or San Francisco. So they may make a good wage, but they actually need um, a full-time job just to secure a fairly modest level of comfort, given the cost of housing. Many people keep working full-time, even though they like to retire or go part-time, because only a full-time job will provide benefits like health insurance or a pension. And lots of people would like to cut back on the hours they work, but they can't for a simple reason. Their boss won't let them. But there's another factor preventing us, I think, from achieving a more leisured and balanced lifestyle. And that is this. That is the intensely competitive social environment in which we live. And this is what I want to focus on here. Competitive is obviously not unique to capitalism or to modern times. The ancient Greeks were fiercely competitive. They did, after all, invent the Olympics. And their poets and playwrights used to produce their works specifically to win prizes. All the same, the advent of capitalism marks a change. As Marx points out in the Communist Manifesto, capitalism destroys all sorts of traditional social institutions, social relations, ties, obligations, and expectations. In the economic sphere, market forces, the laws of supply and demand, come to dominate and determine every transaction. For example, in an earlier time, if, if a faithful servant became old and infirm so that it weren't much use any longer, the family they'd worked for might continue to provide for them rather than just throw them out on the street. At least the nicer families would. Think Downton Abbey. Right? People felt they had obligations based on such things as family, neighbourliness, loyalty and past service. But the owners of factories and mills and mines typically don't feel such obligations. If a worker can't do the job, he's fired. And if more profit is to be made by closing the whole plant, shifting production to China or Mexico, they'll do that, regardless of the impact on individual lives or on whole communities. Why do they do it? Well, they do it, in their own favourite phrase, to stay competitive. Right? Marx also observes that the character of a society's economic system tends to permeate the entire culture. So in contemporary America, we, can, we find the competitive spirit everywhere in the extreme popularity of sport, um, in the way that activities are regularly turned into competitive events like ice skating, snowboarding, ballroom dancing, singing, filmmaking. Many of the most popular TV shows are sports or like football or basketball or competitions like American Idol or Dancing with the Stars. 
We see it in the proliferation of prizes and awards in so many spheres, in science, the arts, music, creative writing, journalism, industry, school and college. We see it in the well-known phenomenon of conspicuous consumption, keeping up with the Joneses, which could just as well be called competitive consumption and can concern everything from sailboats to sneakers. We see it in school, where students start competing for grades in kindergarten now and keep doing, doing so all the way through graduate school. We see it in the intense competition for places at elite colleges, which have students building incredible resumes, taking endless practice SATs, working around the clock just to ace a few dozen AP exams. And we see it in parenting. We've all seen dumpers, bumper stickers like, my kid's an honours student. When you think about it, that message only has a point if lots of other kid, people's kids aren't honours students. I mean, no one bothers with a bumper sticker that says, my kid's got a nose. Right? And it's not, it's not interesting. I often find that some of the most acute social commentary comes in the form of cartoons. And the way that a competitive ethos has seeped into the world of parenting has produced some gems. So here are a few that I thought you might enjoy. Right. She's already gotten a job offer from Microsoft. Um, we're going to the park to size up the competition. Right. Right. Listen, so don't worry, if you don't absolutely, if you don't win, I'll be absolutely fine coping with the huge feeling of disappointment. <laughs> Just remember, so it doesn't matter whether you win or lose unless you want daddy's love. <laughs> to tell the, tell the truth, Ezra, does it look like he's being a more effective parent than me? <laughs> I love this. Wolf, Wolf, he cried for the third time, but this time no one came and the wolf ate the sheep and the shepherd boy never got into any of the really good schools. <laughs> My parents never talk to me about S-E-X. All they talk about is S-A-T's. <laughs> this is good. So he got a trophy for good sportsmanship. That doesn't mean he won't go to law school. <laughs> um, yeah, you've always got to stick it to the lawyers, right? Um, as Marx says, the ethos of the system creeps into every nook and cranny of society. Apparently, if the cartoonists are to be believed, it even gets absorbed by our pets. Three cats. Scamp is so advanced he caught my tail three times today. Oh, very good. Mittens got her first mouse yesterday. How nice. Smudge brought home an elk last week. <laughs> Such a mess. <laughs> of course, those who enthuse about capitalism typically sing the praises of economic competition. It's the goose that lays the golden eggs. There are the golden eggs. Right. Um, right, we have innovation, lower prices, economic growth, better quality goods. Right. Those who accentuate the positive here usually also like to stress the non-economic benefits of competition, such as its power to motivate hard work and produce excellence. It's worth noting in passing, though, a rather obvious point, namely that those who wax enthusiastic about the benefits of competition usually tend to be people who can expect to be among the winners rather than the losers. Others may be less gung-ho about the free market, but they nevertheless, nevertheless accept a competitive environment as the situation we find ourselves in. The New York Times op-ed writers that I read over my bran flakes every morning exemplify this attitude. Nicholas Kristof is a big bleeding heart liberal, but in 2014 he wrote an article titled, We're not number one, we're not number one. It was all about how the US was falling behind other countries according to the Social Progress Index. Thomas Friedman, another New York Times columnist, laments constantly how the US is failing to do what it needs to do in com to compete with the global competition. He compares American pre-college education unfavorably with what he sees in places like South Korea, Singapore, and Shanghai. Globalization and the computer revolution, he argues, means that the only way to sustain decent level of employment in the US is to do whatever it takes to compete with such countries, especially in the high-tech industries of the future. From the point of view of someone like Friedman, to complain about living in a competitive culture would be like fish moaning about how wet their world is. To resist would be like a fish trying to quit the ocean and walk on the beach. The only thing you can do in a competitive culture, in a competitive world, is compete. But is it? One task that philosophy has historically been good at, I think, is asking people to think critically about beliefs or situations that have come to seem natural or necessary. Socrates challenged traditional Greek morality. David Hume questioned some of our basic assumptions about rationality. Karl Marx denied that capitalism is either the natural or the permanent order of things. So in that spirit, I'd like to question the idea that we must all succumb to our current competitive environment by embracing its values, practices, and goals. 
I'm happy to admit that competition can yield desirable outcomes often. Living and working in a fiercely competitive world makes it harder to enjoy leisure. Even when you're relaxing or recreating, you're continually aware that you could or perhaps feel that you should be doing something to make sure you're getting ahead or at least keeping up with the competition. And you may well be right. Those that don't keep up fall behind and suffer the consequences, and those consequences can be serious. This aspect of um, modern life was beautifully captured by Lewis Carroll in uh, Through the Looking Glass, where the Red Queen tells Alice it takes all the running you can do just to keep in the same place. This last point is the one I particularly wish to focus on. Competition is a treadmill. If you stop running, you get thrown off. And if the treadmill spe speeds up, you have to run faster. Now, treadmills are fine machines for those who like to use them. But they're no fun at all for people who don't particularly enjoy working out. Similarly, competitive environments in optional fields like sport aren't problematic. You can simply opt out. But that's not really the case in areas like education or employment. We find ourselves thrown into a world where the price for taking it a little easy isn't trivial. It may mean, for instance, you can't go to the college of your choice, or that you don't receive adequate financial aid, or that you can't pursue the professional career that you'd prefer, or that you don't advance in your career the way you'd like to. Many people are not even able to make enough money just to escape deprivation and anxiety. In a competitive culture, people are forced to work harder than they'd like to or than is good for them. And nowhere is this more evident, I think, than, is the than is with children in school. As I noted before, social commentators like Thomas Friedman worry incessantly about how American kids are falling behind other kids in other countries in their mastery of important skills. Now, I don't deny for a minute that Friedman has good reason to complain about the defects in the American educational system, the main one being the shockingly low level of basic skills and basic knowledge attained by so many high school students. But the solution is not to emulate what goes on in places like South Korea and China. There, the intensity of the competition means that many young people and their families feel forced to sacrifice anything resembling a balanced life, or for that matter, a childhood, on the altar of career. It's common for high school students there to study from five or six in the morning till past midnight, six or seven days a week, getting by on very few hours of sleep, having no time at all for such things as sports, hobbies, relationships, or recreational time with family and friends. In the US, students striving to enter elite colleges don't usually go to that extreme, but something of the same pattern is evident. The anxiety this creates was apparent in the controversy surrounding Amy Chow's 2011 book, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. Uh, tiger Mother is one who pressurizes kids incessantly to, um, to work hard. Giving up on or shortchanging many of the traditional pleasures of childhood and youth, such as nice long periods of undirected play, or just messing about with a few friends, isn't the only serious negative effect of the super competitive treadmill. Another unfortunate consequence is the way it can weaken intrinsic motivation. Students are intrinsically motivated when they study because they love a subject or they just love studying. The motivation is extrinsic when it's directed towards earning grades, winning prizes, improving one's class rank, rank getting into college and so on. And the same distinction applies to other activities, including what we do for a living. In the workplace, money is the primary extrinsic motivator. I admit it would be utopian to imagine a world where the only motivation for any activity is intrinsic. But it still makes sense to do all we can to increase the intrinsic satisfaction that students derive from their studies and employees derive from their work, while steering away from whatever leads them to view they, what they do as a mere means to an end. It makes sense because they'll enjoy their work more and they'll be likely to pursue it to a higher level. Obviously, the most fortunate people are those who enjoy high levels of intrinsic motivation. For them, work isn't work in the bad sense. It's simply what they want to do. It's like they're being paid to eat cheesecake, right? But while an intensely competitive environment may force students to put in many hours of hard work, it can suppress virtues like curiosity or love of learning. Inexorably, the focus starts to be on winning the competition, which means scoring the necessary points, which means making high grades, and relentlessly prepping for specific exams. And those grades and exam scores come to be the end in itself over which students, parents, and teachers obsess. The tail wags the dog, and that is not a, a formula for a happy dog. To go back to the treadmill metaphor, we find ourselves on a treadmill while we're young, and education teaches us to get used to being on it through our working life. There's nothing inherently wrong with being on a treadmill. Met metaphorically, that can just represent being alive, being engaged. The problem is there are millions who have been thrown off it, 
the unemployed. There are millions who'd like to, it to go to more leisurely place, pay, leisurely pace, the overworked. Why does the treadmill go faster than many people want it? Answer, because they don't get to set the pace. So who or what does set the pace? Answer, the forces of competition. Capitalism's cheerleaders talk a great deal about the productivity of competition and the efficiency of the market, but that talk is one-sided, blinkered. The market is undoubtedly excellent for some things. For instance, producing commodities like iPhones and cheap blue jeans. It's pretty bad for producing other things, like affordable housing in San Francisco, or low-cost healthcare, or jobs for everyone that wants to work, or the more leisured lifestyle envisaged by Keynes. The problem is, market forces like evolutionary forces don't care about well -being, anyone's well-being or happiness. So they crank up the speed of the treadmill, quite indifferent to the effect that this have, has on the poor people who are already running on it, and the even poorer people who can't climb aboard. There is a solution. Dramatic pause. <laughs> the government could, and in my opinion should, enact policies aimed at making it much easier and attractive for people to settle for a modestly comfortable standard of living that doesn't require them to work too hard. Specifically, government could guarantee universal health care, free or cheap education, affordable housing through controls on the housing market, an adequate state pension, retirement pension that is. They could also ensure we have a wealth of accessible public amenities like libraries and galleries, museums, parks and gardens open to all. This may sound utopian, but it's worth noting each of these things is available in some countries, many of them available in many countries. To the obvious objection that we can't afford it, the answer is yes we can. There is a vast amount of wealth swishing around the United States. Its distribution is fantastically lopsided, more so than for many decades. The country is much wealthier now than say in 1935 when it passed the first Social Security Act, or in 1944 when it passed the GI Bill, both of which would be considered absurdly or unrealistically expensive today. If we didn't have to worry about the cost of such things as housing, healthcare, retirement, we could afford to relax if we wished to. Ambitious, acquisitive or competitive types, they could still run flat out on the treadmill if they wanted to. They could work as hard as they want, be super productive, achieve excellence and so on. And we can still apl applaud them. But things should be arranged so that people who want to go slower can. To say it again, competitions is a powerful force, but it's naive or dogmatic to assume it always and everywhere produces the best possible outcomes. Competition is indifferent to human well-being. The problems posed by rapid automation and the problems posed by a hyper-competitive system thus have the same solution. Free people up from the sort of anxieties that force them to work harder than they want to and thereby allow a sensible redistribution of work, harnessing the power of automation, allowing people more leisure for all who want it. So to conclude, the single most important idea in Karl Marx's philosophy is this. The social system we live under, which appears to us as a mighty alien power to which we must succumb as a blind force of nature, is actually a human creation that we can, should and will eventually bring under our control to serve our consciously, consciously chosen ends. This is how we should view the intensely competitive culture that we currently find ourselves part of. I'm not saying competition should everywhere be avoided, abandoned or abolished. It has its place and it has its benefits. But we should also recognize that it is a serious obstacle to realizing the vision shared by Mill and Marx and Russell and Lafargue and Keynes and others and me of a world where everyone enjoys relatively leisured, balanced lives and work, in the words of Paul Lafargue, becomes a condiment to idleness. Thank you. Um, questions? Danny. <laughs>